Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Thompson, for being uh, and remaining with the, for the panel discussion. We welcome Dr. Mariana Villar, Dr. Mariana Botasi. You you know them because uh, they've been uh, our guests in the previous summit, but I think that it's important for us to to remind about uh, a little brief uh, summary of what they do, and I think that this is uh, relevant uh, for the discussion we're going to have today. Of course, we're going to have a different perspective because we're going to be having the experience of Dr. Marilena Botassi, who is a, a Associate Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at the Baylor School of Medicine uh, in Houston, Texas. Uh, she's also a professor of the Department of Pediatrics and Tropical Medicine and Molecular Biology and Microbiology, Integrative Molecular and Biomedical Science Program and Translational Biology and Molecular Medicine Program. She's the co-director of the Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development and distinguished professor of biology at Baylor University. So we have a very, very scientist uh, approach with us, with Dr. Botassi. And then we move a little bit on the spectrum of, uh, of communications, and we have a, an expert uh, in Dr. Mariana Villar. Uh, she is associate professor, and uh, she's currently uh, the, a new title that uh, she's holding right now, and congratulations for that, uh, uh, doctor. And I think I have to look for your for for your uh, new position, which is uh, important for the topic that we're going to be discussing, because um, now she is the co-director of the Stephen Kerr Institute for Media Science and Technology. Um, she is uh, working at the School of Communication and Journalism at Florida International University. And she teaches courses in communication theories, research methods, multicultural communication, and advanced seminars in strategic communication. So with this amazing panel, we're going to be discussing some of the issues that we listened from Dr. Maria von Kerkove that may be related to all these uh, issues on vaccines with the presentation that Dr. Thompson's right, uh, Thompson right, uh, did right before this panel. We have a broad aspect on, on how it's going on with uh, information. I, I didn't know you could put oh, so many things on information, misinformation, disinformation, and etc. And I think that's really important and, and uh, interesting. So we're going to start a little bit on, on the communication side. And uh, because you were mentioning, Dr. Thompson, the issue on how uh, people were looking for information on, on online, but many of them didn't trust online information. But they were listening to scientists, but also a very small proportion were actually trusting scientists. So is this related to the way scientists communicate? Do we need to train scientists to have better communication for people, for common people, who lay people who are not scientists? Is that part of the issues that we're facing right now? Let me start to respond, and then I think I'd, I'd like to hand over to the expert in communications. Um, th there's, a, there's a subtle um, difference. In fact, what I showed was, um, at least in Mexico, that scientists were highly trusted, but people weren't hearing from them. Uh, they didn't trust social media, but that's where they were getting a lot of their information from. <clears throat> so let's start with social media. There is, um, there is evidence that suggests that even though people say they don't trust uh, the evidence, what the the information they're getting online, that it can influence their decisions, uh, can have an impact on their intentions and behaviours. So, it is important, and this is not the only kind of uh, factor that will be influencing people's decisions. But for me, the big message here is um, exactly um, what you're getting at. People trust scientists. Um, we know with vaccination, people trust medical professionals more than anybody, and that trust is really um, the currency for vaccine uptake, for vaccine acceptance and uptake. And so we need to equip those trusted voices to speak to people, but they've got to be able to speak to people as trustworthy voices. And that means um, that they have to be credible, they have to be expert, and they usually have both of those, but they have to have this level of concern or benevolence and the ability to communicate to people in their language. Essentially, we have to be able to equip these trusted voices to speak with people, not at people, about what matters to them 
not what matters to us, where they are. And that means whether it's online or offline, where, there's, where, there are, where they are um, in their communities and also where they are emotionally and mentally, psychologically. Over. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Botassi, uh, as a scientist and uh, very into vaccine development and uh, virology, which sometimes is uh, for a lot of people is kind of science fiction. And uh, how do you feel trusted when you speak to people or at people? What is your, your approach in passing very scientific information to those who are listening? Well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. And I very much enjoyed uh, the presentations. Uh, and uh, Dr. Thompson, uh, your, your information is very valuable. So uh, I myself, I'm going to use it a lot uh, as a guide. And, and, and thanks for being with you uh, and with uh, my tokaya, Marielena. It's nice to have two Marielenas on the screen, uh, which is great. Uh, but I have to say, I totally agree. I think um, we also, as scientists, albeit I agree totally that not only scientists, but all of us in the clinical or health professions usually are very highly trusted, but we don't have um, a culture of being the ones who are the voice for the people, uh, those who are really um, uh, sharing that scientific knowledge with the population at large. And I think that has to change and that probably has to change starting from how we get ourselves trained in an, our, our own academic settings, right? That we not only are training the next generation of scientists, including the, the ability of them communicating and communicating in many different languages, not only languages as far as uh, Spanish, English, Portuguese, etc., but also languages of presenting the information to other scientists, presenting the information for policymakers, for presenting information for communities. And I actually uh, personally have to tell you that um, in my personal experience, I, for instance, um, did that by actually getting trained myself. Uh, and I am a, a Leshner Fellow in public engagement in, in science of the um, Association for Advancements of Science, the AAAS. Uh, and that was very valuable for me. In fact, I actually trained with a cohort of Leshner Fellows in infectious diseases pre-pandemic, but now it was like absolutely transformational for me to have had that guidance, that ability of, of uh, practicing at some level, um, learning um, the, the different tools of how to myself uh, present the information. And then has therefore been very valuable because uh, <clears throat> within the realm of all the information that is out there, communicating in my case, how do you really develop vaccines? Um, the steps that we take, the rigorness that we do take to ensure that we indeed therefore uh, show confidence, even though you may hear that these COVID-19 vaccines were developed very quickly, it really wasn't very quickly in itself because we're really uh, building on decades of uh, scientific information. And I think um, it also changes the optics of the individuals when they then are going to receive a vaccine, knowing of you know, the many years and the many um, steps that we have had to take at the level also of laboratory science, right? So I think that uh, scientists do require to be trained. Um, Practice makes you more uh, certainly um, easier for us, but we need to have the opportunity of not only understanding how to do it, but also practicing it. So back to you. Thank you so much. Dr. Villar, I, I think that this is important to see how many issues get interlinked here. But I, I think that there's a lot of communication, there's a lot of messages, there's a lot of uh, people receiving messages from everywhere the formal message from the governments, the information that everybody in an individual capacity is looking for and trying to skim on those, that information and trying to listen what is the government saying. Is there a political message there? Is a real scientist, is a very clear message there? And then all the issues and all the messages and all the misinformation, disinformation that we're getting through WhatsApp groups and uh, that we're getting and bombarding from all levels, from people with uh, doctoral level to 
family members and everything. Can is there something that we have to start working in, within the ministries of health on moving from uh, health education to health literacy for people to be able to scheme a little bit better in these uh, messages that they're receiving? Well, thank you for having me as well. And it's, it's an honor to be here with my fellow panelists. So, and I'm, it's very exciting to see that kind of the science of strategic communication is, is kind of understood to be an important component of this, right? I mean, because just like there are years and decades of, uh, of research on the clinical side of it, there's years of research on how you spread ideas, right? And we, and like uh, Dr. Thompson said, retailers have used it to sell us, you know, forever and like change our behavior and what's popular and what's not. So, you know, there's a lot of things that we know about the messenger and the credibility of the messenger and how, um, you know, what types of arguments are likely to be more effective with different people. So these things have to be merged, right? The, the, the science has to be merged with the norms and the beliefs and kind of like what's right for me and who, and you know, there's a lot of things that contaminate, um, that make noise, right? So the, the relationship with the government, people's perception of the government, um, there's lots of disparities around the world, but even um, in the United States, there's a lot of disparities and depending on who you are and what you look like, you have a different kind of relationship and trust with different government agencies and things like that, right? So kind of under, you know, understanding that there's different audiences, I think that's important. Um, trying to, uh, you know, doing that research and that listening to see what they're, what they're talking about, but also who they would be influenced by. Um, and, you know, so not only in, in strategic communication, but also in community health, there's decades and decades and decades of research of what works for different communities. So in that sense, it is a little frustrating um, you know, that it's another pandemic as if we've never had one <laughs> and we, we've had them before. We learned a lot with AIDS. We learned a lot with a lot with, you know, a lot of these um, vaccine preventable diseases and, and promotores and people going into communities and peer educators and all those kinds of things. And yet the investment isn't there, right? The investment isn't there. So I think that that's why this conversation is important to keep having. We also know that every, you know, all prevention campaigns work typically to change behavior and reduce incidents, but then when the when the expenditure on prevention goes down, the incidence starts going up again. That's true for almost every preventable disease. So yeah, so the, just as this as the kind of science and investment happens on the clinical and treatment side, and, you know, also to do that on the social side, because that, you know, human behavior is what's going to impact whether this works or not. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Thompson, I, I, I did, as you know, I, I was working in Pajo and uh, the, we have to face where, where I was there, Zika, chikungunya, yellow fever, etc. So th these are really issues that there was a lot of communication needed from the, from from and for the people uh, in terms of prevention, in terms of what to do. But this is something that there's a risk communication manual, there's risk communication strategies. And from your perspective in, in, in UNICEF, and probably you have been seeing this, have you seen variations in governments in the use or not use of risk communication strategies and this adding up to the misinformation? I think, yeah, there's been some heterogeneity. <laughs> um, I think your point is really, is really important. So we have seen different um, levels of efficacy in terms of uh, authorities' um, ability to communicate uh, what they're doing, the decisions that they're making, uh, the evidence that is emerging, you know, rapidly emerging and rapidly changing. Um, and I think we see uh, where they do follow those manuals. <laughs> and, you know, some of this stuff's pretty basic, right? It's, it's be clear, it's be transparent, it's tell people what you know and what you don't know, and it's tell them all the time, every day, 
like, you know, whether even if you've got nothing to say. These are very basic principles, but we know that they work. Um, a lot of governments, I think, and, and authorities have failed to do that. We've seen often um, other organisations and even right down to community level organisations stepping in and filling the gap a bit. But if you don't have that happening at the, at the kind of top of the pyramid, I think it's very, very difficult for the rest of us to, to, um, to, to clear the muddy waters that people find themselves in when they're hearing mixed messages or no messages from governments, from authorities. Um, I think what we've seen here in this pandemic, which is of great concern to me, is um, very, very strong politicization of, uh, of uh, the responses to the pandemic, of vaccination in particular. A couple of years ago, um, a couple of studies looked at whether people's decisions to vaccinate kind of correlated with their political stance. Um, this was a study in the US, but, you know, we're using a good model and there was no correlation whatsoever. Things have changed. <laughs> yeah. Things have changed, right? Yeah. And so we're in a situation now where um, we really have to depoliticize these conversations around vaccination, about around vaccines in particular, but more broadly about the, 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 the virus and the pandemic so that we can start to give people a clearer um, uh, more consistent message. Thank you. Dr. Botassi, uh, one question related to vaccines, vaccine acceptance derived from information coming from potential side effects of the vaccines and the perception of which vaccine is better than the other, and thus uh, making people to go to the extremes, to go to seek for those vaccines, uh, because the one they're being offered in the country uh, is not the one that they think is the best one. Do you think that uh, the messages around the side effects of vaccines were, and as you as a virologist and a, per a person working with vaccines, were very well designed and some of them might have created fear of receiving the vaccine and thus creating some hesitancy in some groups? Do you think that there was a, a different strategy should have been taken there? Oh, absolutely. And when you when you say was there even a a again risk communication or a communication strategy around this, there was absolutely none, right? And I think this also highlights a couple of aspects here. Who exactly should be doing such communications? And we've seen uh, unfortunately a very a huge silence from the regulators, whether they are regulators that are you know, national, local, international, right? I mean, they are the ones that really have the responsibility to shape those discussions and those imp that information, because in theory, they're also working hand in hand with very um, critical, and albeit also maybe even at some level lacking in certain regions, of pharmacovigilance, right? I mean, you need to, when you're rolling out an intervention, you have to have very good systems of how you are going to be communicating any of these uh, potential risks. But at the same time, you need to be capturing the data that is going to really support through pharmacovigilance, what are these kinds of events that you may um, uh, uh, find or identify. And I think that is a clear example that there was absolutely no pre-planning on how to handle um, when you were starting to deploy all these vaccines, um, the, the, the messaging around the understanding of the safety and as they were compiling real life evidence beyond the clinical trial data, how they're going to be compiling all the pharmacovigilance. And here we also see that even in uh, countries that you would argue have very um, well-designed pharmacovigilance systems. Um, there was some attempt um, of communicating, which I agree with Dr. Thompson with the respect of at some level even politicizing such uh, information. But then there are um, regions of the world that we are really still unclear of whether there is even a pharmacovigilance robust system. Um, and this also maybe to summarize a, a little bit highlights another gap that I feel uh, 
needs to be also addressed. Um, and as you know, now everybody's speaking more about the, the need of decolonizing, right? Whether it's decolonizing research, whether it's, you know, allowing that some of these um, accountabilities and some of these responsibilities really should um, arise and should be built within a given region, that we cannot assume that, for example, in this case of safety, waiting for the high income countries to guide what the safety um, should be or, or communicate that safety when in theory, we also have to adapt it and, um, and, and build it on the basis of the, of the setting of where that you know, information comes out. And therefore we have to be very cautious at you know, all the time, you know, our countries, especially the low and lower middle income countries, always have to rely on waiting for others to tell them what is going on, rather than our own countries building self-reliance and sufficiency in themselves gathering all this information, because then it can be dis discussed and translated in a way that it's more appropriate and more understandable to the populations in a given region. So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you. Dr. Villar, back to Miami. Uh, with all these things going on, I think that there's also part of uh, beliefs and it comes to this uh, conspiracy theory that the vaccine was ready before the pandemic because they wanted to sell it and they wanted they were ready there and uh, and uh, they were just holding it by the time it was just kind of, we can release it. Of course, we, we know it's not true, but I, I, I think that there's also part of uh, issues in terms of how it was informed um, to the people that these were vaccines created, taking in consideration already a platform that has been studied for a long, long, long time, and is not something that just pulled out of the, of the sleeve. Uh, and I think that, can that be related to part of the hesitancy and all this misinformation and, and now this information that is passing here uh, around vaccines? Do you think that that played a role in how people are reacting to the vaccines? Sure. I mean, that I mean, again, the, the 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 different kind of relationships with government, the different perceptions about pharmaceutical companies, right? So the, all, there were all there were problems already pre-existing with trust there. Um, trust in general of governments, corporations, you know, has been decreasing in the last decade. Um, so with that pre-existing kind of trust challenge, and then you have the disinformation, which is the the kind of deliberate um, providing fault, you know, incorrect information to with the purpose of confusing or or co sowing conflict or something like that. So the the kind of the the ground was fertile for for that disinformation to take hold. Um, so you know, which is one which makes me think about who should be talking about these things. Who's the right messenger? And you know, on the one hand, the governments are not being the loudest voices and social media listening. And um, Dr. Thompson, you can share if this is also your experience. But the ministries of health and the and the health experts are not the ones talking up the most. They might be out there, but they're not the ones with the most echo. They're not the ones that are. So the you know, as we know, false information is easier to share because it usually has more of that kind of clickbait, shareable. Um, look at this incredible information, let me share it with everyone I know, where government information perhaps is more, more boring, less sensational. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, the, the, the governments are, are the ones establishing the programs, the pharmaceutical companies are the ones developing the vaccines. And they have trust, you know, trust and credibility issues. So that's where we need to understand, you know, partner with communities, partner maybe with um, other people that have, that do have trust, right? And kind of help to, help to explain. And then there's, you know, an underlying also lack of knowledge. There's there's kind of a, a bell curve in science communication of how technical you get before you lose people, right? But like the process of clinical trials and how medication, how medicines are approved and, um, you know, how decisions are made about, about using one vaccine versus another. 
so it's a, you know, it's a challenge and a lot of, and a lot of this message testing that Dr. Thompson was talking about is important, right? Like what do people know? What do people want to know? And what's the thing that will help persuade? So, um, so yeah, I mean, definitely it didn't help, right? <laughs> that there was this misinformation about, about the, you know, the, the conspiracy theories, but again, we live in a world that's, that's getting, that's just fertile for that. It's ripe. So, you know, and those kinds of things are likely to take off. Thank you. I, I want to invite you to go to our, uh, social platforms, look for hashtag, uh, COVID summit 21. And we have already, uh, the misinformation management guide that Dr. Thompson uh, spoke about. So if you would like to, to access it, please uh, follow uh, our hashtag, participate in the, in the discussion on social media. It's also a way of uh, communicating very short messages, but don't do any disinformation, please. <laughs> Dr. Thompson, back to you, we'll go back to, to France. Uh, trust. And I think that this is a big world, big word in this world about trust. When we see France, where you're living right now, where you're staying right now, with uh, access to vaccines uh, and not having a real trust in government because of previous experiences, how does trust play a role when developed countries that have access to vaccines don't use it, don't, don't go and get vaccinated. When many people who would like to trust vaccines don't have access to it or trust vaccines that they don't have access to it. How can you balance this? How, how can you do something? How can the government change this trust issue into really bringing mistrust into trust? The French example is a good example. So um, <clears throat> in the last uh, pandemic, the H1N1 influenza pandemic, um, France didn't do very well. They purchased uh, enough doses to vaccinate 75% of the population, um, those who needed it with two doses. So over 90 million doses and ended up using six. <laughs> and that was largely because there was a, um, a detectable inflection point in people's, uh, in public trust, in uh, the program that was being implemented. And in the end, people said no. Um, they've taken uh, a lot of uh, important steps towards uh, rebuilding trust uh, in the vaccination programs here. Um, they've had a large, a very broad public consult uh, consult consultation process that informed their uh, subsequent uh, strategies. We've seen um, um, a reasonably effective implementation of mandates, but, but done in the right way. We've seen coverage rates go up and we're doing pretty well. You know, the, every dose in France is being used at the moment, as far as I'm aware. Whereas um, we do know that many doses that have landed in low middle income countries, for example, in the African continent are not being used. So we have to be careful about um, any assumptions that, uh, <clears throat> You know, in certain countries, people just are, 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 are dying to get vaccinated. And in other countries, uh, because they've got the vaccines, because they're rich, because they're better off, uh, there's high levels of hesitancy. Hesitancy manifests similarly in just about every country. Um, it fluctuates according to different uh, determinants and, and trust is an important one. But those assumptions we have to put aside now. So there was a very um, interesting just a, just a study that, that pulled out a correlation, but a pretty good correlation between a metric of institutional trust. So people's trust in all of the institutions in their country and uh, coverage rates, vaccination coverage rates uh, across Africa. So we know that trust is fundamental. Um, we know that things can be put in place at a government level to build trust. And I think, you know, the process in France is a good model, but also I think, um, as Dr. Villar was getting at, we have to activate all of the other trusted voices and they have to be equipped and galvanized to be out there speaking. So for example, <clears throat> UNICEF in many countries has really strong, long relationships with faith leaders 
who are very trusted voices within their communities. And we work very closely with them um, throughout, I mean, and pre and post pan, pre and during pandemic um, to communicate with their communities about what matters. Our partners, PGP, had a really interesting project where they um, worked to reach um, uh, poorly accessed communities in the US uh, to provide them with information about influenza vaccination. And they used what we call micro influencers, people who might only have you know, a couple of hundred people, maybe thousands who follow them. They mapped out those micro influencers, they enlisted them, and they provided them with content, they provided them with things, but they also just sent them a prompt. You know, you can use what we've produced or not, but just remind your, your community that you know it's time to get the vaccine because the season started. So I think as we heard before, we know what works. We just need to be doing it um, at, at scale. We need investment. We need to be we need to be doing this at all of these different levels, and we need to be doing it now, but we also and this is a really important point. We have to be doing this really well in 10 years time and in 20 years time, because we're not, we're not eliminating these diseases. We've always been tackling public trust issues with vaccination programs and we always will. So I'm hoping that this pandemic will be maybe the trigger to get that level of commitment and investment uh, in the things we've been hearing about, the things that work that mean that we can foster public trust, which we need for the public community. Over. Thank you, Dr. Stompson. I think you, you, you brought up a very important issue about influencers and how to use what you have in hand. And sometimes people tend to forget about those strategies that can really reach people in a different way, especially younger generations that are in a different level in terms of how they get messages and, how they, and who they listen to. So, Dr. Dr. Villar, in your research, have you seen this potential impact of influencers in vaccine acceptance? Yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely. I mean, I don't know that the research on this particular moment on the COVID vaccine is there, but um, definitely people are influenced by their healthcare provider and their family and friends, right? Is who is, and right now, a lot, most people communicate, a lot of people communicate with their family and friends on social media. And they also hear from celebrities and other people that they trust on social media. So there's definitely opportunities there to have the information out. In fact, there's a current project with the Global Health Consortium um, to work with medical professionals in Latin America who have a, a big social media presence and um, kind of start creating those communities and, and more intentionally putting out the message of other medical healthcare workers, let's use our social media to get the voice out there, right? To kind of have critical mass from those trusted voices, right? Um, out there competing with the, with the misinformation. So um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the different people are influenced by different folks. Some people, sometimes it's a good uh, strategy to influence children, for example, in schools or young people on social media to then influence the people, the older people in their families, right? If that's one, if that dynamic exists, um, sometimes it's really more among friends and, you know, the, these WhatsApp, you know, in a lot of cultures in Latin America, for example, families have big and, and co-workers and friends have big groups on WhatsApp and a lot of misinformation has been spread there. We need to find ways to spread good information. And, you know, there is a lot of content. If you go online, a lot of countries and a lot of agencies have produced excellent content. So now it's kind of how do we get figuring out which is the one the most effective right that a b testing and uh, how to get it to people and you know volume volume matters and that also costs money right thank you so again i repeat we you have access to the to the guy that dr thompson was uh, speaking in his presentation if you follow our hashtag hashtag covid summit 21 you can reach to that uh, guide guideline use it and for you younger generations who are listening to us, you might be around the, the close to 1,000 people listening today. Please, if you're going to be doing something on TikTok, use some information that has that guideline and do something wise, please. 
don't do, don't misinform, don't disinform, use it wisely. And uh, Dr. Botassi, now we come to the other side. What is the message or what do you think we can do as public health professionals when public health professionals and health professionals don't want to receive the vaccine? What is, what is the potential impact of health personnel, public health personnel, not willing to receive the vaccine and the impact on regular folks? Yes, I mean, you bring up a, a very interesting uh, question. And I mean, remember, at the end of the day, they're all human beings like everybody else is, right? So I think what we need to do is um, be good listeners too and understand why is their own uh, hesitance or, or how can we increase their own confidence independent of whether, of course, you know, the, the fact that they are that they are also a part of this ecosystem of healthcare providers or that, that, that are interacting with the general community in, in there for providing some health service, right? So we need to understand what, where they're coming from and why they're coming from. Um, and maybe again, it's just the um, misinformation or disinformation, uh, you know, working for example, ourselves within Baylor and Texas Children's Hospital, we have done many ways of reaching out to uh, our own workforce community to answer their questions. Maybe it's just that they were not really um, understanding again, the process of how we develop these technologies, um, the rigorness of how they are being uh, tested. And, um, and again, a little bit the fear of, you know, uh, of the, of, again, the pharmacovigilant, right? Of the safety profile of these uh, new interventions. So uh, most of the times it's just really also presenting the information in a way that um, it can answer uh, some of their uh, concerns. But I agree, I mean, since we understand that, you know, they are kind of also the messenger, we need to make sure that they as messengers also um, have the right information in front of them or that they can find where are the resources where they can really look at, um, uh, the, you know, where, that, where the evidence-driven information can be found so that they can make their own assessment and their own um, decisions. Um, so I think that um, is another area where I think we need to raise the, our efforts, again, in the concept of training or maybe um, uh, uh, establishing, especially us that we work in uh, academic-based type of health uh, systems, right, you know, with with hospitals that are linked to an academic infrastructure, we have many ways of how to provide that, um, that information in a way that then it can be used uh, for them to be able to then translate to the patients or to uh, those who they serve um, in the profession. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Biyer, I, I, I think that there's a long, I mean, big, big range of issues going on around communication, around uh, health literacy uh, uh, around uh, all these groups and uh, things that are happening. But what we have also different strategies within the governments in terms of we are not going to force anyone to get the vaccine. You are free to choose, which usually is what happens with vaccines. But there's also when we speak, and there's some countries that say you cannot bring your child to the school unless they have the full uh, vaccination scheme. So that's one way of you're free to do, but you have to do. And now with the uh, COVID vaccine, you are up to you if you get vaccinated, but then we might go to the other extreme. You have to be vaccinated if you want to work. That's an airline that was saying that uh, if uh, uh, cabin crews want to go back to, to work, they have to be vaccinated. There was another bank in the United States saying, if you want to come to work to the office, you have to get vaccinated. So how can we balance this? Well, um, I mean, it's, it, yeah, it is interesting and it varies by country, right? The, the United States is, is generally not for government regulating things. And there's a lot of local regulation and private companies are able to kind of regulate themselves. Um, where in other places, the government has a bigger power to, to kind of mandate things. 
And, um, you know, they both have issues. <laughs> but what we do know from the public health model is that, you know, you understand the risks and you need people to change their behavior. And, you know, you encourage them to do that. And then you also place kind of infrastructure <laughs> that supports it, right? And, you know, and, and laws and regulations are part of that. So part of it is also how it's communicated, right? And if it's, it's been an interesting discussion here in the US where, where schools do have requirements of vaccination requirements and you know you have to go through a lot of bureaucracy to be exempt from them and somehow there is a discussion of the government can't force me to vaccinate but if you go to public schools you're, they're already forcing you to vaccinate right so it's kind of the explaining things in a way that you know with the understanding that there's going to be other people twisting it right in an rolling it out, anticipating this inoculation, message inoculation, right? It's not that we're forcing you, is that now we have this great vaccine that will prevent your children from getting sick, just like we have for chicken pox and measles <laughs> and all these other things, right? And um, I guess framing, the framing of, of these things so that, you know, there's always going to be people for and against the governments, I guess, you know? Um, and that and the politicization, especially when it's government programs that are providing the, the vaccinations. So that just has to go into the whole analysis of the, of the best communication strategy. But yeah, I mean, and, and again, the values, right? We talked about how vaccination attitudes have a lot to do with personal beliefs and values. So if you believe the government shouldn't force you to do something, or if the government recommends something, you automatically are suspicious, then that's the ecosystem we're in, right? And we have to communicate within that. So. Thank you. Dr. Thompson, how can we turn things that are happening, in negative things that are happening, into a positive message? For instance, countries where we have seen uh, vaccination going, starting with the over 60s or over 70 year olds, <clears throat> And then this staggering of, uh, of uh, age groups, as Dr. Um, Maria van Kerkhove was saying, uh, how can we, and we are seeing now cases in those uh, age groups that have not been vaccinated or are starting the vaccine, how can we turn the, the message from something that is happening that is negative, that we see a lot of cases in these age groups into trying to make them realize that the vaccine is there and that vaccines can have a positive impact in saving lives. How can we turn the message? How can we turn the message when a person gets vaccinated and gets COVID within the five days after vaccine? How can we turn around this, these issues into a positive message? Um, I'm not sure I want to start with the last example. <laughs> that one's a tricky one. Um, but, but I think it's, we have a lot of science, a lot of evidence now that, that tells us um, how we can potentially reframe things so that um, as, you know, as Dr. Vidar said, we can position what we say within people's values, within their beliefs, within the way they see the world rather than counter to that. Um, I mean, a very good example is, and, um, the president of the United States actually tweeted something along these lines, and I know the person, I know who he was probably advised by, but he said something along the lines um, that getting vaccinated gives you the liberty, the freedom of being able to return to a more normal life. We know that two moral values correlate with people's decisions to vaccinate, purity and liberty, and people who hold libertarian values um, often are more hesitant to get vaccinated. We've seen the, the, the mixing and blurring of um, vaccines and other libertarian issues um, around COVID-19 um, <clears throat> happening. You can reframe that so that you put it in within people's viewpoint. Um, in terms of increased incidence, in terms of uh, perhaps decreased access to vaccines, first of all, scarcity often creates desire. It's often not such a bad thing to not have quite enough vaccines um, because that creates you know, uh, that, that triggers people to actually want it. But that's maybe a, a slightly facetious comment in the current context of gross um, immoral inequities in vaccine access across the world at the moment. So perhaps I'll park that 
What we do know, um, re research that I've done, um, suggests that when we have increased incidence of the disease, that's helpful because we people have to understand why they want to get vaccinated. They have to understand the threat in order to accept the mechanism that we provide them, the solution that we provide them to cope with that threat. If we just tell them there's a vaccine and they don't see that that provides a way of coping with a specific threat, why would they get vaccinated? If we provide them with a threat, there's this terrible disease, but they don't believe the vaccine is a, is a, is a solution, then they're not going to take that solution. So we, we have to, in our messaging, in our communications, very carefully balance simultaneously the threat and the solution. And there's a, there's a model, a behavioral model protection motivation that we've shown holds up pretty well in vaccination. Um, they're, they're like two or three examples of the science that we have that can tell us how to communicate. Social norms, if we tell people, everyone's getting, you know, lots of people are getting vaccinated, people are more likely to do what they think others are doing or what they think others want them to do. We know many of these levers, many of these triggers. The challenge is getting the right one for each person because it will be different from person to person. I think I've answered your question a little bit tangentially because it was too difficult. <laughs> I didn't want to put you on the spot, but I think the tricky questions when when you are in a panel and these ideas come, and uh, <laughs> that's part of my job to put the difficult questions for you, the experts. We're coming to the closing of the session. I really appreciate. Uh, I'm going to go around, and we'll start with Dr. Botasi. Thirty seconds for your last message. Then we go to Dr. Villar to Miami, and then back to France to Dr. Thompson, and then back to me in Mexico City. Dr. Botasi, Houston. Yes, thank you. And so my final message is we academics, we of course that also lead a lot of educational programs in whatever field we work on, we have to remember that incorporating science communication and training ourselves in the next generation on how to be better communicators uh, is essential and crucial. And I think uh, the COVID-19 have highlighted even more what we have been saying for, for decades now, that it should not be a hobby to do science communication. It should be part of the, our daily activities as scientists and as academics. Thank you so much. Back to Miami, Dr. Villar. So I, I agree with everything that Maria Elena Maitokaya said. <laughs> and, um, and I guess what I wanna add is, um, you know, the importance of understanding the audiences, right? That it, this, is a strategic communication like you, it, persuasive communication as other kinds too. So understanding, doing that research, right? That that requires time, the listening and the research and the engaging community gate, gatekeepers and things like that to really make sure that you're, that you're using the resources in the best way possible. Thank you. Back to France, Dr. Thompson. Thank you. What great comments. Um, what can I add to that? I think the COVAX facility is, um, the concept and the execution is a moral victory, but we're still a long way from the public health success. Uh, we don't have enough vaccines, they're not getting to people, but we're also seeing that people are not necessarily accepting them when they arrive. Um, the investment in that facility in vaccines is substantial. The investment from that facility in generating public trust and demand for vaccination is minuscule. We need investment, we need investment. We need to build the systems that we heard about before, not just to produce the vaccine, develop the vaccines, um, test, the, produce the vaccines, track the vaccination programs, distribute the vaccines. We need to develop the systems to, 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 to sustain and foster public trust in real time um, over the long term. If we're, if we're going to do better, uh, if we're going to be ready for the next one. Over. Thank you so much. I think Dr. Sampson is going to be thrilled on interest on the guide, the guidelines that you were mentioning. So uh, thank you for bringing it up in your presentation. And I hope that you see the increase in downloads in Spanish. So for those who have been asking, again, you can if you follow our hashtag, uh, COVID Summit 21, or you follow uh, our Twitter account, uh, FIU Stemple in Twitter, you can have access to the link to download those guidelines. So use them wisely, read them, use them on the daily work. I appreciate the work uh, and the participation of, of the three experts. Dr. Botasi, muchas gracias, thanks so much. Dr. Villar, muchísimas gracias. Dr. Thompson, thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. 
gracias. We really appreciate your participation and your messages. So we're going to make a, a small break uh, before going into the second session. We'll be back at uh, three or four minutes. Don't go away. We're just changing the platform for the new uh, panelists to join us. So muchas gracias. Merci beaucoup. Obrigado. Gracias, Tom. Bye.